Good evening. Hello. Hi, everybody. Hi. How are you? Great. Welcome to the church. How many of you have been here before? Amazing. Welcome back. And for those new faces, I am very pleased to welcome you to the church in Sac Harbor. My name is Sherry Pascarella. I am the executive director. I am joined this evening by our wonderful team that includes Samuel Havens behind you, Kristen Santori at the door, and Juwan Cruz around the house. Um, we are founded by April, Fish, April Gornick and Eric Fischel who are artists, and the spirit of fostering creativity, art, and honoring the history of Sag Harbor and the East End as Maker's Village. We do provide artistic programming all year round across artistic disciplines, and we also have an artist residency. So I want to invite you back if you're interested in guitars and interested in the wonderful work and history of John Monteleon, who you will be learning much about this evening. Um, John will be included also in um, a panel discussion, a roundtable conversation with G.E. Smith and Matt Umanov on the history of guitar, or in the future of guitars, excuse me and that will be on December 2nd. There will also be a concert with G.E. Smith and Yorma Kokonen in the portrait series. This will be here on December 15th, so please come back. We have lots of great things going on before then, um, including tonight's program, which is a screening of The Chisels Are Calling, a film by Trevor Lawrence. You can give him a round of applause. And the film details the life and work um, and the relationships of Trevor and John Monteleone, one of our country's great luthiers. So without further ado, uh, the program, the film, runs about an hour and 40 minutes. It will be followed by um, a Q&A with Trevor and John, and will then be followed by uh, some songs on John's guitars played by Howard Emerson. So thank you all for being here. Thank you for coming back for the church. And I'll see you in about an hour and a half. What a film, what a life. Really remarkable, extraordinary. Um, it begs the question, how did this all come together? How did it start between the two of you? OK. Um, well, this, this started. Um, um, some years ago when um, I, I had already made a film called Harlem Street Singer with Woody Mann, who was my producing partner on this. And um, after we finished Harlem Street Singer, we went off and did other things. Woody was touring, he's a great musician, and uh, I made some other films. And, um, and then one day I, we were talking and I said, well, do you have ideas for, you know, I'm finished these films, do you have ideas for a new film? And he thought about it a bit, and then he suggested uh, John, and um, because he'd always been a huge fan uh, of John, so we had some meetings, and um, it seemed like John's life would play out in scenes because he had all these great stories that you that you saw on screen. So we we shot a um, an interview, like a test interview with with Rod Franklin, our who was our cameraman on it, and it went very well, and that's how it began. And now, uh, unfortunately, and some of you may know this, but Woody Mann passed away this past January, and, um, but he was a huge part of this film. He was my producing partner, he was also the music supervisor, and I would rely on him to test all my edits out uh, on, so, and a lot of the music in the soundtrack is, is Woody's music. So, you, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a shame he, it's not here with us, obviously, but that Woody is, was the, the start of this project. Thank you. John, how did it feel for you to be approached by someone? Did you know Trevor before? Uh, I remember, am I on here? Yeah. yeah. I remember the, the meeting that we had uh, when we started talking about this idea. Uh, and first of all, I couldn't believe it. Uh, this Wait, you of, couldn't believe what? I couldn't believe that they wanted to take an interest in my work and present it the way that they had in mind mm. uh, as a documentary film. Uh, it, it took me by surprise. But uh, I was 
certainly happy and, and elated at the idea, of course, but it, it seemed to me that it would be an interesting way of bringing the idea of what these guitars, uh, what they do, what they're about, and hopefully bringing it to the general population so that they could further understand it and relate to it, you know, in the broader sense, beyond myself, but to the instruments and the musicians who make this music. And the, and the art of being a luthier, which I think is, is really eye-opening, uh, the story that is not only about you, but the art behind the art of making the instrument. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that there's anything, uh, anything, anything we might have missed, like anything that didn't get covered in the film that goes to the core of the art of being a luthier? Well, uh, luthery is an old uh, occupation, practice. Uh, it goes back hundreds of years, many hundreds of years, really. Uh, the term luthery really comes out of uh, loot, the loot making, and all of the uh, associated types of instruments that were being developed hundreds of years ago, coming through the Middle Ages, the Renaissance, uh, and becoming more developed. Uh, luthiers were working very hard to produce better instruments all the time, giving musicians inspiration to try and meet that challenge, uh, which really gave birth to a, a great abundance of, of uh, the amazing catalog of music that we know in the world that really came out of all of this. If we go back to the violin world, of course, then we go into the orchestras, uh, orchestral type of instruments. Uh, but the guitar itself was one that really took an evolution in many forms, but became more sophisticated along the way into the 1800s, till it comes to the 19, about 1900 or so. We begin to see uh, the company like Gibson, who really, uh, if you go upstairs, you'll see a, a perfect example of Orville Gibson's guitars. Orville Gibson was responsible for uh, initiating the archtop idea into a guitar design, uh, which was basically a flat top instrument prior to that, and still is, by the way. These things coexist. Uh, but the idea uh, development, the birth of the archtop guitar, came about then. And then, if you, uh, and I encourage you to go back into the history from 1900 forward and see if you can follow the development of the Archtop guitar as it was applied to music, pop music of the day, which seemed to have changed uh, about every 10 years or so, the different styles of pop music would change. The advent of recording, uh, radio, uh, and live performance, all of these things started to play into the need to have a, a better instrument. And that gave rise to in the end, guys like myself, who really took it upon themselves to see what they could do to, to, to make that kind of a development. I, I appreciate that point. And, and some people who were here might remember, uh, were here for G.E. Smith's talk. Anybody raise your hand if you were here when G.E. Smith came and talked to, played some of the instruments, including the Gibson, and described the history of guitars as coinciding with changes in um, history and industry and telecommunications and what happened over the course of, of time from this guitar from 1810 to, to the electric guitars that are the later examples in the show was the world got louder. Mm -hmm. And as the world got louder, you know, there were first trains, and then there were, you know, automobiles, and, and then there was a whole world full of, of noise that, the, that musicians were competing with, and this made the need for a, um, a, a differently designed instrument that could handle ampl amplification until, of course, these were. Anyway, I'm just uh, paraphrasing for those who, who might have missed that conversation because it's a really, uh, syncs well with understanding your art form and your object. I have a question for Trevor, however. Um, 
did you, how much did you know about guitars and about John before you began this project? Well, I am a guitarist. Oh, um, okay. Yeah, and so I, quite a bit. What's that? Quite a bit. Yeah. Uh, so I, um, I was a student actually of Woody Mann's, but before that, I already played jazz and, and stuff, just not as well as I would have liked. But um, there was actually a time in the early two thousands when I went to one of those guitar shows with Woody, and we wound up back at your house for one of those parties that you see in the film. And now John doesn't remember because there were like 40 guitarists walking around. Uh, but I remember playing, um, I'm not sure which guitar it was, but it was a, a big bodied red guitar at John's house and just thinking like, I can't believe this, but I can play better on this guitar than I can play, basically. <laughs> uh, but I never thought of it as like, oh, well, I'm going to make a film about this because there's a difference between great art and a, a story. And, so it wasn't until you know m many years later that we we had that meeting and we figured out that there there actually is enough material here that there that it works out into a story. So. I I think I have to say I think it was a stroke of luck really that you and Rod who the the film uh, who did the cinematography and still shots and and whatever we were all guitar players right. all of us. Uh, so there was a, a common, a common bond between us that we could all speak the same language and relate to each other quite easily. So it really made the process, really very enjoyable and easy. Yeah, definitely. And I, I think we, we paid a little bit of attention to make sure that we weren't talking guitarist to guitarist and that it was wider. But it, it wasn't that, that that hard really. I mean, I, I've seen some things done on news or something that you can tell it's not done with the knowledge of the instrument and by musicians. So that's what, I liked it, that we were able to be authentic uh, just because we were all, we are all guitarists. Yeah, I think it was good also that it wasn't, it wasn't to be an instructional film per se. Right, exactly. Yeah, it reads a lot like a love letter, you know, like an homage not only to John, but also to the craft that he practices as well as to the guitar itself um, and that that was my experience of the film anyhow and it's 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 beautiful in that way how how long were you guys in each other's hair in order to get all this footage and tell this story in this manner well we started it in um, we did one shoot in like December of I believe it was 2017 and that was just to get a some footage and to start getting it off the ground. But then we, we really shot it like, uh, I think it was, was it later that year? And we did principal photography in, in one year. And then during the pandemic, I ran around with a small camera around New York City and got shots of like Radio City and, and all that kind of stuff. But, but um, so it's sort of like, um, I, I find with these films that getting it to that stage where you're nearly done, you can sort of do it in a year and a half. Or I mean, it varies with everybody, but then to actually totally finish it. So we've been we've been working on this together since then. So it's been like five years or something. <laughs> Whose idea was it to go to Europe and take this great pilgrimage to the woods? That was really John's idea. I mean, we had talked about it, but we didn't know where in Italy we would go exactly, right? Because we had talked about there was something else going on. And that was fairly close to the end of the film, and then John got this opportunity. Do you want to? Yeah, well, I, I always enjoy going there for sourcing wood, because it's obviously one of the best places on the planet to get spruce and maple. And it was a, a, an opportunity to, uh, to go to this festival that I knew about, uh, because I had a deep appreciation for violin making uh, there, there's relativity to it, to what I do. Um, so it, it turned out to be uh, a perfect opportunity for us to just go to this one gorgeous place. Mm. Uh, and uh, It really was amazing. It was kind yeah, of like a yeah. fairy tale. And I could shop yeah. for wood, too, at the same time. <laughs> and I actually, yeah, on the, there's a DVD coming out in a few months, and there are special features, and one of the special features is that first half of the Italy section, which is five minutes in the film, blown out into 18 minutes um, uh, of that whole 
experience and there are, there's there's more footage with the cows and and John oh, yeah. and I was going to ask you about the cows <laughs> that's yeah, right yeah. <laughs> they hold secrets that's right mm -hmm. It is beautiful footage. It's, it, it becomes, um, uh, it, in watching the film, it is this turning point and a surprise, almost, almost like a twist. Uh, and the star, or the drama being that gorgeous landscape and the, the view of the mountains, which is really quite beautiful. Um, does anybody in the audience have a question for John or Trevor? Yes? Um, yeah, oh, we have a microphone coming to you. But where do you get some? Oh, excuse me. Where do you get some of the more like exotic woods and, and things that you use for your inlays and the, um, you know, whatever? Okay. Well, there can be a lot of stories here, but I'll I'll narrow it down to uh, one example. You may have seen it in the film. Some pistol grips, mother of pearl pistol grips that I use. I cut them up. Uh, they came to me from someone who just happened to poke their head in my door one day. And he was a retired cop from New York City, and his job was to melt down weapons, crime weapons. And he would pull off the mother of pearl grips from the guns and put them aside over a long period of time. He accumulated a, a beautiful candy box, this wooden box he gave to me, filled with mother of pearl pistol grips. And each of them must have had a story, of course. And uh, they all had holes right in the heart of them, which made them almost impossible to use. It took a long time to figure out, yeah, there is a way to use them. So that's what I made these fan type of designs on the heels of the guitar and other places. But there are many places to, uh, to explore for uh, materials, mother of pearl, abalone, seashells. I collected them for a long time. Uh, I, I even use some precious and semi-precious stones for inlays. So it, it can be a lot of different things. You just missed him. <laughs> no, we, we don't know that. I, I understand that he's going to be bringing a, uh, a Broadway type of show that he's been working on, uh, that he did the film soundtrack for. Uh, it's playing in Scotland now, and it's, I believe it's going to come to New York, so keep your eye out for that. How many guitars are you working on at any one given time? Probably about uh, no less than three or four, probably about seven in total, but they would be in very different stages. And it might even be one or two that are so involved that may take a long time, like years. Uh, I'll tell you the longest project, uh, I didn't bring that guitar today, but uh, I started an experimental guitar 30 years ago. And uh, it was a, made of red cedar entirely the entire guitar to try and prove a point for making a classical arch top guitar and it never really worked for me. I could not find the strings that were appropriate for it. So therefore the guitar sat in the back of my shop for 30 years. I would look at it every once in a while and, uh, and then time would go by and then one day I said, you know, we got to do this. And so I sat down and I finished the guitar up last year and uh, I found the right strings for it, and uh, it, it, it only took 30 years. <laughs> and of those guitars you're working on at any given time, how many of them are commissions versus your own explorations or, or private works of art? I'd say 80% uh, mm, a 80, 80 to 90% are commissioned. The other 10 would be probably experimental and also personal projects, like the Four Seasons guitars. That was a personal project uh, outside of everything else. It was on my own time. But I, I, I enjoyed doing the experiments if they have real foundation to them, if they, if they seem to be plausible and really good ideas. And one of those experiments was with side sound on the guitar, and that's where you'll see sound holes on the side that deliver the sound directly to the musician's face, to their ears. And uh, it turned out to be very successful in the mid-90s. 
and it, I apply it to most of the guitars that I build these days. And how often, how do we see your, or how do you often see your guitars in use in public places, like in, in concerts, and and in what context? Or are they, because in the movie they show very well in these intimate settings, as well as in collectors' homes, um, and, and less so in like a, like on a big stage or something like that. Uh, okay, this could be a long discussion because it, it can be sidebarred so easily. <laughs> But uh, I, I always saw the guitar being played, the mandolin, or whatever it is. I don't care what the musical instrument is. It's there to be played. And it's there for the musician to explore and to exploit, to be inspired, hopefully. And that, that's the really simple idea behind it. Um, there, well, I'll just leave it at that. Okay, great. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions for John or Tra Oh, well, I have lots right here. Here, uh, you have the mic coming. I don't have an apprentice. I, I've been approached many times. Um, I find the way that I build. I, I like to have complete control of the instrument, from the silliest little thing to the most complicated thing. And there are times when I wish that I had an extra pair of hands, but. The integrity of the instrument, in my mind, is everything that's in it and why it belongs there. It was selected specially to be there rather than, it's not built by committee, it's built by one person. Um, Sam, we have somebody in the back, but no. Oh, I just want to ask, what does it feel like to have a lineage as illustrious as yours? <laughs> uh, you're too kind, thank you. Uh, no. Um, in, in a way, it, it's hard for me to, uh, to, to look. Sometimes I, I watch the film as a bit of an outsider, uh, uh, just like anybody else. And uh, I still go back to my, if we can call it work, I call it play, I guess, but uh, that's what I, I look forward to, and I don't pay much attention to any of the rest of it, really. I just go back and do what I love to do. You know? It's very I'm special. lucky to do that. Very lucky, yeah. How effective both of you in terms of the graphics of the film? When you were doing the Art Deco, you showed the... Uh, the uh, okay, when you were uh, doing the Art Deco graphics, um, you showed the old Las Vegas train station. Which one of you guys came up with that? Uh, well, that must have been me, but I'm having trouble remembering exactly which image. Um, did the, just, as it's, just as the Art Deco uh, section starts? In the middle of the Art Deco stuff. Because, you know, I grew up in the Oh, wait, is it, is it Union Terminal? Or, oh, or? this is the downtown Las Vegas. Oh, it's the downtown Las Vegas. Vegas. had it on there as an example of okay. uh, yeah. art, because what happened is, um, there wasn't even a question about preserving it. They just tore it down and built an ugly hotel. Oh, I see. But Las Vegas, I grew up there. It was a wonderful place. There was a place called Nick Esposito's Music Store where tons of jazz players came through with all the great guitars that you uh, yeah. were modeled after. And it was, it was really interesting to see your development because there were so many, you know, just, I mean, these were the guys who played in all the shows you know, played with the great players. It was a, but that, that particular picture that you took to the trains and you took all this stuff and you put it into your stuff, it, 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 it's amazing that you're able to uh, uh, give significance to something while not actually even changing anything about the basis of the guitar, right? Just right, right. The guitar always had to be the guitar. Right. There's a foundation there that if you, if you walk away from it, uh, you're going to lose it the value of what that is, uh, what it's all about, in its most simple form. But the embellishment of design is something that has to be done, I think, rather carefully and in a balanced manner. It's so easy to take it uh, over the top. And uh, the guitar is the one thing on the planet that everything uh, you can do to it is being, has, has been done, will be done, just because People can do it. But you have to say you're, you're incredibly prolific in oh. terms of you, 
turned them out. I mean, maybe it doesn't seem that way to you, but you know, it's quite, quite low. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. You are, an, you are an amazing artist, and so we're appreciative that you're here bringing this. We can all see. Thank you. And here. And I'm so curious, you're so discerning about the woods and the tones. When you record your instruments, I see mostly microphones being used. Yeah. But when you do apply a pickup in an acoustic guitar, yeah. what do you use to get that same good wood sound okay. from the pickup? Good question, yeah. Uh, I, build, I always built the instrument as an acoustic instrument first. It has to pass that test. And uh, I always felt that I could put a pickup on any of those guitars. Uh, so it has to be acoustically what it can be, the ultimate, and then I can put a pickup on it. And if you uh, hang around, I hope you all hang around because we have an example of that over here that Howard Emerson's going to play for us in a little while. I don't make up the pickups myself, but they're custom made for me. Yeah. Hey, John, I, um, I had a question that kind of related to uh, the question that the young lady asked in, in front of me here about um, a, a, your, uh, an apprentice. Um, in that, um, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm sure that the room is filled with a bunch of guitar players here. And, and one of the things that, uh, you know, that occurs to me is uh, lots of us don't have Monteleone guitars, but lots of us have guitars that probably could sound a lot better if they were set up by somebody like yourself, which is not going to happen. But I'm wondering, like, who you would recommend to take a guitar to to have it set up correctly or do you have a go-to person that you think about that sensible? or is it something people can do themselves like there's no, is there one not trick something i can do myself <laughs> <laughs> okay uh that's a that's a tough question to answer in, in because, particular an arch top john yeah because i think uh when it comes to repair and restoration of instruments and setting them up correctly it really comes down to a one-on-one -on -one situation based on that instrument uh, what it can, what can be done with it, what should be done. Uh, there are many questions to be asked about that between the owner of that instrument and uh, the potential of where it can be taken, who can do the work. Uh, and that has changed over the years. Um, uh, I haven't kept up really with a lot of the uh, the, the choices uh, that could be made. Some of them are, are old friends of mine that go back a long ways that still are doing repair. But the generations have changed over time. I used to do a, an enormous amount of repair and restoration. That's one of the re ways that I learned how to do what I did. Um, and I highly recommend that too. But. Uh, I, I don't have any names right off that would be accurate enough to what you're asking. I mean. I don't know if you have people that you're, you have a relationship with. We, there are a couple of luthiers out here on Eastern Long Island, one of whom actually gave a, a really wonderful uh, talk and demonstration last month. Um, I, so I, I think that my understanding from him and from GE is that what has happened is that the guitar has become the most popular instrument on the planet in history. And that has led to a lot of more careers and markets and advancement and innovation um, than ever in the history of the art form. Would you agree yeah. with that? Yeah, when I started out, there were no books, there was no internet, there was nothing. Hardly anybody I knew built instruments outside of Jimmy DeQuisto and John D'Angelico. Uh, but as uh, an amateur type of building situation, it was kind of new to me, but in the 
early 70s, late 60s, early 70s, I was beginning to hear about other people like me who had similar ideas and questions about how to go about this. And this was a group of individu individuals that formed the Guild of American Luthiers. And so there is such an organization that began sharing information among uh, the members. Uh, it was a wonderful way of learning and, uh, that has led to, I think, some of the great uh, building that we know about these days. There are many fine builders out there of guitars, mandolins, banjos, all that. Uh, but home, uh, home uh, remedies and home repairs uh, used to be an ugly situation that uh, <laughs> would turn up on my doorstep from time to time. Uh, nowadays, it sort of changed a little bit because that you can now, you can go out and buy a guitar kit. You can buy a mandolin kit or a banjo kit and you can put one together yourself, uh, which is a, a, a fun thing for people to do. Can be. Um, oh, we have a couple of questions. Oh, Myrna, did you want to ask a question? And then we have somebody back there. Um, well, this is partly a comment and then one question. I, I was just knocked out by this film be, and by the subject and the way everything was so integrated with your craft and art, architecture, industrial design, Italy. <laughs> um, and I felt that we were watching it in exactly the right place since the concept of the church was about making things. and. A lot of us are thing makers. I mean, just have to make things. But it was so inspiring. And I love that you didn't make the same thing very often, twice. And that, the, um, that you even drew on the, and did, did you do that very often? When, because the little figure in the winter, I think it was, the winter guitar. Yes, I, I do a lot of drawing or sketching for ideas. Uh, but when you, I found that when I did that, nothing can replace working with the materials themselves. So they take a, a, a different dynamic. When, as soon as you bring out some materials to play with them and see what they can give you, it sort of moves away from the drawing a little bit. But the drawing is very important in getting you started. So yeah, that's where it begins, mm -hmm. to see if it, it is possibility there. I mean, and Myrna made a great point because it is, the, in fact, the mission and the purpose of the church to um, promote and support um, and foster the history of making, of art, and of creativity. And, and most of the people who, are, who make up our community here are people who have some kind of vested interest in that practice. So it's very, uh, such an appreciated audience here for understanding um, how exacting and, and how much depth there is to your work as a, a, a handmade practice, which actually what the show was about. It's very gratifying to, to watch and to see the film. Um, do we have two other questions, one there, and then the man with the hat? I have a feeling oh, I know what the answer is going to be, but I'm <laughs> asking the question anyway. Is there a musician, a, a current musician, or one from the past for whom you have not yet made a guitar and who, for whom you believe you, who you strive to make a guitar for? Uh, probably yes, but I don't know if I'm ready to name who that would be. It's <laughs> a great question, fun question. Yeah. I appreciate that. Yeah. We'll that? see, we'll see how that turns out. <laughs> uh, our last question, sir. Shall I pass you? Um, how involved is the finish in affecting the tone of the box? The finish of the instrument. Uh, it's rather important, yes. Uh, it's important that you don't apply so much or too much, and it's important to apply a minimal amount that's protective enough to endure. Yeah. Nitrocellulose? Nitrocellulose is what I use uh, for lacquer on most of my instruments, yes. I have used poly uh, uh, 
what we call a French polish, but uh, that really a applies more to violin type instruments. Mm -hmm. Is there a waiting list? Like if I wanted to buy one, like how, what would the process be like? The process of buying an instrument or yeah. ordering one? Yeah. Well, I, okay. Uh, we have one person here I can think of who uh, we had conversations about building an instrument. Uh, I can mention Leslie if she doesn't mind. Uh, Our executive producer. <laughs> yes, Leslie Evers here. Uh, I just built a guitar for her. We had conversations, and I do this all the time with anybody I'm building a guitar for, is to get to know them, get to know their music, get to know what they don't like, because that's the easiest thing to put your finger on, is what do they not like? What do they not want? Then we can figure out what it is they do want, and then begin going down that road. Uh, so it can lead to uh, something fairly straightforward. And a lot of times people will just entrust me because I do have the experience of building for a long time. I can kind of figure out where they want to go with this. But uh, hopefully uh, I'm trying to open the door to inspiration mm. so that the musician can now discover things that they may not have had access to. Hopefully. That's great. It's amazing. Well, thank you. Thank you both. Thank Congratulations. You. Trevor, best of luck. Best of luck with the film. And I hope the film gets shown more places. If you guys see the chisels are calling elsewhere, please, please go watch it and support it online and in DVD. And John, it's a pleasure. We look forward to seeing you on December 2nd. Oh, yes. Yes, me too. I'll be back. Wonderful. Oh, and now we are going to be joined by, sorry, I can't believe, by the wonderful... Howard Emerson. Howard Emerson, playing two Monteleone guitars, which uh, you guys can see them up on the stage um, uh, if you want to get uh, not too close, but close enough to see them in person. They're, they're quite extraordinary. I mean, you can actually see from here that these guitars glow with an aura that is otherworldly. Re they're really wonderful. Thank you so much. Have a great night, everybody. And thank you, ha thank you Howard. There we go. Okay. Um, I actually had the fifth guitar that John ever made, and he was still learning, but more than that, what I asked him to build is really, I didn't, I didn't really have a clue. By the time I had John make this, I knew exactly what I wanted. And uh, when, when I asked him to build this, I guess it was about three and a half years ago, and I got the first text picture from him on April 1st of 2020 while I was laying in bed with COVID. I had just gotten it. I felt horrible. And seeing that picture, at, at that moment, it was, uh, am I going to get to see the finished product? You know, it was, it, was, it was a horrible, horrible, wonderful moment. So, um, so this guitar means a lot to me, and uh, John named it uh, La Corsa, and uh, I'm not sure why he did that, but uh, of Corsa, uh, he had a reason. But in any case, uh, I, I had to make it actually fairly shallow, because I sit when I play. I, by the way, I, I don't really perform out much, so you'll have to uh, forgive my nerves. Um, but I like something to be very comfortable underneath my arm so that it's not jamming my shoulder out. And, uh, well, anyway, yeah, so it's a 12 fret. It's got a standard scale, which uh, everybody seems to call short scale. And it's made out of quilted maple and red spruce. And for many years, there was, there's been a picture in John's shop of a mandola that he made for Elizabeth Taylor's son. And so she's wearing this bright red dress, but there was this gorgeous violin red mandola in her lap. And I have fixated on that instrument ever since I saw the picture. And that's really why I asked John to make it this color. So uh, I'm going to uh, not even play it on the microphone. I'm just going to play for you acoustically and uh, 
Hope you enjoy it.
you get with the game on. And he lays there and they the guitar falls and he can't get it to the lady's company. Thank you.